Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us here on episode number 784 on our YouTube channel. Well, hey, today we are heading out to Oregon, not too far from Portland, and we are going to be looking at, we're going to be talking to the owner of a very interesting cattle ranch supplying beef to multiple restaurants in the Portland area, three to five beeves per week, every week of the year. Really interesting how it's all set up and how it all works. And we're going to start profiling that for you right now. Hannah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. I'm always thrilled to to interview a, a neighbor. And since you're in Oregon, yeah. I consider you a neighbor. Exactly. <laughs> Just uh, one state over, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> one state over. Well, I'm excited to talk about your ranch and everything you're doing. I, I love your website. I've been going through it in preparation for the interview. And I think you've got a great website and uh oh, you, thank you yeah you bet and you got great photos i uh i really like the looks of where you guys get to raise cattle so excited to learn more about that let's do this uh can you just give our listeners just a brief introduction of yourself just tell us about you personally kind of a little bit of your history so they can get to know who they're listening to definitely um so my name is hannah laney and i'm a second generation farmer in oregon um, up in the willamette valley um, up in canby oregon um, I uh, started my career in the beer industry and then um, took over the family business at the beginning of 2018. Um, and I've just been kind of working on expanding the business that my parents began um, and kind of seeing uh, where I can take it. And I sell pretty much exclusively um, in the Portland area, Portland, Oregon. Okay, wow. You have had a charmed life. You started your career in the beer industry. Is that with those delicious Pacific Northwest microbrews? Yes, luckily, yes. It was it was great to start uh, working there. Um, my parents actually grew barley for Rogue Ales oh, um, out here in Oregon, and then I worked as an intern for them in college, and then actually after college moved to Colorado for a while and worked for a brewery called um, Great Divide Brewing Company. Oh wow! Um, and then was pulled back. Uh, with the siren song of the family business. So I still do a little bit of beer writing here and there, but um, my main job is uh, doing the farm thing. All right. I don't think I can continue this interview because I'm so jealous right now. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I mean, there's so many breweries, you know, there's always know. room for a side gig. My favorite beer of all time is, and mm -hmm. I, I can never get it. I can never get it is rogues uh, American Amber Ale. I love that. Oh, I love that beer. And uh, oh, nice. I've been to the Rogue Brewery in Newport a couple times. Uh, really enjoyed oh, uh -huh. going over there. Matter of fact, uh, for everybody listening, uh, so the Rogue Brewery is right on the bay or right on the, what would you call it, the inlet or whatever you would call it there in Newport, Oregon. Yeah. So mm -hmm. right there on the ocean. And the first time we went there, I, I, became, I fell in love with the brand because we walked in and you walk in through the door to go to the public house and you're just right in the middle of the brewery and there's nobody there there's no uh there's no safety oh, yeah. there's no safety tape or guardrails you're just walking through the brewery and there's a bunch of signs that basically say hey you're in a brewery don't get hurt and i <laughs> i just loved <laughs> yeah. it yeah that's uh that's the, definitely the rogue way for sure i mean they're actually a, a family business as well yeah so second generation family business as well so yeah that was very really cool. cool company all right so sorry to get you sidetracked here what did you do for rogue no problem. Um, so I only worked as an intern um, during the summer when I was in college okay. um, for them. And then um, I d when I decided I wanted to try something new and move to Colorado, um, I worked as the um, marketing coordinator for Great Divide. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. Okay. And then, and I'm sorry, what year was it when you got, when you got called home to the family business? <laughs> so I worked there... Um, from 2010 to about 2013, okay. um, and then worked for my parents for five years and then took over the business in January of 2018. Okay. All right. Now, you said that your parents had started this operation. When did they begin that? Yeah. So actually, when I was in college, um, so it would have been in 2008, 2009, um, they began the business um, on my grandparents' farm. So my grandparents owned a farm that they retired to. Um, in the early 90s, and they ran it as a small business and as a, a hobby farm. Okay. Um, and they also had a horse operation, which is separate from what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, but they um, 
ran that they have that farm they, my grandma still lives there today unfortunately my grandpa passed away uh, in 2011 but okay. my parents began this business um, as a way to kind of expand the farm um, and so they began with one sale of one beef animal um, mm-hmm. to a customer that I still have today um, called Urban Farmer Steakhouse uh, in downtown Portland okay. so they began it uh, just with one little sale and grew it to what it was in 2018 and uh, handed off the reins so they started out, they sold one steer to a restaurant. They that did. Was, that was just one steer. Yeah. So. It, yes, just one steer. How do you, how do you sell, <laughs> That's how, it began. how do you sell just one steer to a restaurant who is serving meals to people night after night after night? Right. So luckily um, here in Portland, there's a real thriving um, farm to table movement. Um, Portland's pretty well known for its kind of emphasis on localism um, mm-hmm. in the, in the restaurant scene. Um, and they partnered at the time with a couple other family farms, um, and then they also had, you know, more of the commercial beef for their menu as well. So it was it was a bit of a supplement to mm-hmm. their full menu of uh, traditional na- national brand beef. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it just kind of came up, and the they were dining at this restaurant, and the the chef was there, and my parents said, "Hey, well, we have animals, we could." We could sell you one and see if you like it, and um, you know, over ten years later, here we are. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, yeah. so it's it's Laney Family Farms, and you can find the website yep. at laneyfamilyfarms dot com, and that's Laney L A N E Y, uh, in Laney Family Farms. So if folks want to check that out, okay. So let's Perfect. let's talk about the business today. Now that you have it, describe and kind of give us an overview of what the business looks like today. Right. So um, our business is comprised exclusively of, well, not exclusively, I guess. We have a couple home customers, uh, some locker beef sales, but it's a very small minority of our business. But the vast, vast majority of our business um, is wholesale to restaurant and butcher shops. Okay. Um, So we are basically a custom finishing operation. So we sell finished beef um, that is processed at a USDA facility uh, here in Mount Angel, Oregon, and it is sold to restaurants as either whole, half, and quarter beef or subprimals, so New York's tenderloins, briskets, what have you, or ground beef. So all of our um, beef goes out that way. We don't do any uh, live animal sales, just exclusively um, our finished beef. Okay. Interesting. So when you say it goes out at a whole half or a quarter, so I sell holes, yep. halves, and quarters myself, but I direct market them to individuals. And whenever mm-hmm. somebody wants a quarter, that's always a big challenge because they only break the beef down into halves, and therefore if they're getting a quarter, they're splitting a half with another customer. Is that the same situation you're in over there near Portland? Um, so we're lucky to have a good relationship with uh, the processor we use called Mount Angel Meats. Um, and they will hang our animals. So part of our, our marketing, I should say, is that we whole carcass dry age our animals 14 to 21 days. Uh-huh. So we also do all of our aging at Mount Angel. Um, but they cut the animals into quarters. So they hang the whole carcass, and then I can have them um, cut off a hind quarter or a front quarter. Um, so there's no splitting um, of quarters. We don't offer a split quarter um, to anyone because it's so feasible to just – do an, an enti- entire quarter. Gotcha. So, so then, yeah. but there's different cuts coming out of the front quarter and the rear quarter, right? For sure, yeah. So I, um, if somebody, well, if a home customer approaches us, it's basically just if we have the the beef available or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in that, in that instance, I'll just give them a list of everything they would get in the front quarter or everything they would get in the hind quarter. Okay. And they make the decision on that. But as ter- in terms of restaurants, um, basically the same idea. Um, I will tell them what's available in each quarter. Mm-hmm. They decide what's best for their um, business or their menu, and then uh, go from there. But I would say okay. the majority of our customers purchase subprimals and or ground beef. Okay, so your cu- so basically, you've got two different products there. If if it's a quarter, it's a front quarter or a rear quarter. You choose which of those two products yes. you want. Exactly. And sometimes I do have to tell customers, you know, we just don't have it. Um, We're a relatively small business. We're currently watering between three and five animals a week. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a a weird middle ground. We're we're bigger than the kind of boutique brands, but much, Mm -hmm. much smaller than than the regional brands. So kind of a 
a no man's land <laughs> here in okay. the middle. And when you say three to five animals per week, is that spread mm-hmm. throughout the entire year or is that seasonal? Yes. So it is spread throughout the entire year. And that's something that also differentiates us between other uh, local beef brands, at least in our current market, mm-hmm. is that we're proud to offer as close to the exact amount of beef every week of the year. So we re- yeah, um, we're lucky to partner with a um, a partner family farm who provides us with weaned calves. So we're okay. actually not a cow calf operation. Okay. Um, so we partner with uh, this neighbor of ours, and mm-hmm. he has access to calves. So we receive four shipments of weaned calves a year. Okay, that was going to be my next question, but you answered that one. So <laughs> you're getting four shipments of weaned calves. Is your, yeah. is your partner adjusting his calving seasons to keep you with similarly aged beef for when they're going to going to slaughter? He is, and then he also has a small network of partners that he partners with, you okay. know, um, kind of people nearby who will have a handful of animals um, that will be born when we need them to be born. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also have the the way that our animals are separated on the farm is it's all by weight class, roughly 200 pound weight variations. Um, okay. And then we rotationally graze and then we have uh, lots of different areas for animals. So mm-hmm. we kind of, we weigh our animals about every other week okay. or so. So um, we can kind of pick the all-stars and move them through the program a little quicker and we can kind of titrate the program based on the weights that we're getting coming in. So well, let me ask you this. So if you're going based on weight, then mm-hmm. the age of the animal is not nearly as mm-hmm. big of a factor for you, right? No. So really the only thing that we come up against is in order to sell, um, you know, USDA certified beef, which we have to for our wholesale customers. Mm-hmm. Um, we cannot have any animals that are over 30 months, Okay. Um, which we're finishing the animals much earlier than that. So that's rarely an issue. Um, okay. Typically, the animals that we're finishing reach the desired live weight that we have, which is approximately 1,150 pounds mm-hmm. um, in 12 to 18 months. Oh, really? 12 Total. to 18 months. What are you raising? What breed of cattle? So we, re- we raise a, a mixed breed herd, um, but there is an Angus component in all of our animals. So we have very few pure, purebred animals, maybe a handful of Angus, um, 100% Angus, but um, we have Angus Simital, Angus Charley, Angus mm-hmm. Pinsgauer. Um, we have some black baldies. We have all sorts of okay. um, breeds. Okay, interesting. But all within that kind of continental, um, I mean, you know, we don't have, we have very few, if ever, have had, um, you know, uh, any of the Boss Indicus breeds. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So no, none of so. those Southern uh, Asian type breeds. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All European, Pretty much all, yeah. all European continental. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So that's, that's quick getting to that 1100 pound weight. And this is all done on grass. No, they're grain finished as well. Oh, they're grain finished. Oh, you know what? I'm sitting here yeah. staring right at your website where it says that. Okay. So grass fed, no grain home. finished. Yeah. Okay. Now, it is. Yeah. I, I hear dry aged all the time. What do you mean when you say dry mm-hmm. aged? So it does mean a lot of different things. Um, in our case, we hang the entire carcass um, in, the, in a temperature and humidity controlled environment under mm-hmm. USDA inspection um, for 14 to 21 days, which is not insanely long, but in our opinion, just enough to give it a little bit extra of that kind of more robust flavor that our customers enjoy. Okay. Now, grain finishing. Uh, it is so yes. so popular these days to grass feed, grass finish. Yes. You're in the grain finishing market. You're you're you're. I mean, these days you almost call that old school. Um, because sure. there's so, mm-hmm. so many people that want no grain at all. So how do you find your niche with the grain finished? So we found um, we're really lucky to work with um, chefs who, in many cases, have worked all over the country and are very familiar with all of the different types of beef that are available in the market. Mm-hmm. So we have, I would say, maybe only two or three times have we ever had someone stop buying our beef in favor of a grass, an entirely grass-fed product. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so our chefs are by and large pre-educated when they when they come to their restaurants where we find them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we have chefs who prefer a grain finish, and so that that works well for us. And we do have, you know, there are some specialty places where we aren't the number one choice because of that grain finishing. And the grain does include corn, which is something that I try to be very upfront with everyone mm-hmm. with. Um, and that's people, some people don't enjoy that, but uh, that's typically more at a, a retail facing environment where mm-hmm. um, most of our customers are, are restaurants. And restaurants. So that's interesting. If I were to stereotype anywhere, I would say Portland would be all grass finished, but it's not. Yeah. It's interesting because um, it, de- there is a, definitely an element in that, of that, excuse me, in the, uh, in the kind of specialty market, um, you know, offshoot mm-hmm. type of consumer. Um, but Portland is also a place that draws from all around the country and lots of people move here from other states, um, for a variety of reasons. And so that kind of creates a, a much more diverse dining experience scene, um, than, than other mm-hmm. cities. Interesting. So uh, I'm picturing your place. You're, so I guess I should ask you before I say this, how long mm-hmm. do you grain finish for? How long before slaughter date do you start graining them? So our animals actually start eating grain quite early. Um, they start getting access to grain when they're, we go by their live weight um, when they reach about the 750-pound mark. Okay. So about a little after halfway through their lives um, in terms of mm-hmm. their live weight. Um, and then we do it all based on a percentage of that body weight. So they start off very, very minimal and uh-huh. then um, get, you know, graduated up through the program. And then towards the end of finishing, when they reach those higher weights, the the maximum percentage of grain that they're getting is 50% of 3% of their live weight. Okay. So they're getting grain at one level or another for upwards of six months of their life. Um, yeah, it sometimes doesn't necessarily translate into the months because animals do tend to vary a bit in how fast they grow. Uh-huh. Um, but the way I look at it more is that they're getting grain for about 400 pounds of their okay. growing span. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, so grain finishing them, uh, you found a market for that. That's great. And so when it comes to this business model, let me, I don't necessarily want you to tell us your prices or I'm not going to ask you what your prices are, but you're feeding a lot of grain yeah. and mm-hmm. you're going to restaurants and um, I don't know how this all impacts everything. So do you, yeah. do, do you, I guess I can ask you this, do you get a premium for your beef by going to the restaurants in this way? We do. So um, we're moderately priced in comparison to other boutique brands. Okay. Um, we... I, I run a pretty lean operation. Um, it's not super high margin, um, but there are ways to keep costs down. We um, raise our own hay. So my parents run a hay operation mm-hmm. on our other farm, which, which my parents own in, uh, in central Oregon. Um, that helps keep our costs down as well. Um, and then in terms of getting a premium, we, we do run a little higher than um, you know, feedlot beef or, or commercial yeah. grade beef, um, but really not not too crazy. So it's more just in terms of how to run the business efficiently and where you can find some inefficiencies in your model, um, okay. in which we found in kind of the percentage of grain. And then, like I said, switching to the homegrown hay mm-hmm. um, and that rotational grazing as well. So in years like this, we've had green grass um, for a lot of the months of the winter that we don't typically have. Uh-huh. Um, so some years you just get lucky too. Okay. So when so. you when you talk about um, the boutique brands that are at the high end, um, mm-hmm. what what is the high end that you're seeing in Portland that people are getting for for a whole beef um, when they're you know they're the boutique brand you're talking about? Um, well, I've seen you know I can't speak to the whole beef prices that I've seen at restaurants because I don't know of. Mm-hmm of those numbers. Um, although there is, there are some, especially when it comes to products like Wagyu or, or those types of things, um, those prices I believe are almost double what we sell for. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when it comes to the, where you do see that is more, um, in the locker beef, 
um, or in the in the retail beef. So we have you know locker beef animals that I've seen available seasonally that are getting in the high sevens to mid eight dollar a range per pound, um, is that which live- is vastly higher. Okay, is that live weight oh. or hanging weight? What what are we talking about there? It is hanging weight. Hanging yeah. weight. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they those are much much more expensive than than our products. For Interesting. Sure. Um, and part of what we you know being able to sell every week of the year and every month of the year um, helps because we're not backloading costs and and backloading inventory mm-hmm. um, into a selling season. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Um, it's also why we kind of in, avoid the, the farmer's markets. We don't sell at any farmer's markets mm-hmm. um, because we appreciate the more steady pricing that we have with our customers. Mm-hmm. Um, we rarely take price increases. Um, I have the same pricing that I had two years ago. Okay. Um, and I think that's something that really plays well um, with our wholesale customers. And they understand that the price doesn't fluctuate much at all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what if uh, what if your inputs go up? Like in terms of corn prices, they've been down the last few years, but a few years back they were, you know, it was eight bucks a bushel or whatever, and it was really high. So how yeah, does sure. how does that impact you? Do you just absorb that with your margin, or will you raise the price if your inputs go up? Um, if the inputs went up enough, I would raise prices. It's not a you know, it's definitely like a not a situation where I would never raise prices, but. Mm-hmm. Um, I would try to absorb it for as long as I could, and depending on what the increase was, um, maybe pass that on to my customers. But the good news is I have a great relationship with my customers, and that's something that I would talk to them directly about, um, and they would understand for sure. Absolutely. Well, Hannah, let me take a moment here just to acknowledge a couple of our sponsors. Everybody, uh, we're talking cattle, so let me lead off by talking about Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment. Just so proud to have this great company as a sponsor of our show You know, I have grown up around Powder River equipment. I've been hearing about them all my life. And now on my own farm for my own cattle, we've got a Powder River squeeze chute, Powder River panels out there to take care of our cattle. And they're developed out here in the West with some of the wildest cattle you will ever encounter coming in off of public ground. And if they can handle those cattle, well, they can certainly handle yours. So please check them out over at powderriver.com and let your local farm and ranch retailer know you'd like to see that Powder River green out in their sales yard so you can buy the finest livestock handling equipment out there as well. And, of course, Lacrosse Boots, Lacrosse Footwear, everybody. Hey, a Portland brand, Lacrosse Footwear. And you can find them at lacrossefootwear.com. Just thrilled to have this great company, this historic company, as a sponsor going all the way back to the 19th century, serving our soldiers during World War II. Just thrilled to have them as a sponsor. And, of course, we use the Alpha Range Boots from lacrosse footwear on our farm every day they are certainly built to work as hard as you do ideal for chores around the house and farm they are waterproof comfortable and available for both men and women and i will tell you that we have proved that time and time again here on our farm in idaho and we hope you will on yours wherever you are at as well you can find them at lacrossefootwear.com all right Uh, hannah i heard you laughing at me when i mentioned the portland brand you've got to be familiar with lacrosse Oh yeah, for sure. Definitely see them all around, all around the Willamette Valley. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, this is this is really cool. I love hearing about this because I'm always trying to spice up my business model on the farm side and and do a little bit better. And uh, so you you stay. You said your your beef prices they're not too much above what people would be paying at the auction. Is that right? Uh, well, in terms of the I mean, versus the auction, that's kind of a separate because we don't sell any live animals, so right. I can't really speculate on that. But um, yeah, our, we our prices are actually fairly close to um, to bigger commodity prices. Okay. Um, but what, part of that is we just make less money. That's kind of the reality of this business, yeah. and I think that's kind of why there are a lot of people who aren't interested in selling it the way we do Mm -hmm. um, because it's more consistent, but it's a a little less money than you would get when you kind of ride the, the winds of the commodity market. Sure. Okay. I think I've got it. I've got it. So let me ask you about this. When you are approaching a restaurant and you're wanting to sell them beef, 
I got a couple questions mm-hmm. about this, but my first one is, yeah, how do you compete with the the Wagyu market? I mean, that's like the premier beef going into restaurants now, this and that. So are is every restaurant wanting to go that route or are the restaurants are like, no, that's not our deal. We'll go with different breeds of cattle. So that's a great question. That's something that we come in contact with a lot. Um, first of all, let me kind of start and talk about how we get customers in general. Um, the restaurant m- industry has such high turnover rates um, that we, I rarely am approaching a new restaurant and asking for their business as a cold call. Um, I'm typically coming through the door knowing at least one person that I've worked with at another mm-hmm. restaurant who's familiar with our brand. Okay. So that helps for sure. Um, and then when it comes to Wagyu, I just start the conversation by saying that's an entirely different product than what we offer. Mm-hmm. So for someone who's there's a there's a company that sells Wagyu near us and it's a beautiful product, mm-hmm. um, very popular. And so normally I'll say, you know, if you're interested in Wagyu, you should go with these guys. Um, I don't even try to compare our beef to Wagyu at all. Um, so I think people kind of appreciate that, mm-hmm. um, and my customers know exactly kind of what our operation offers. Um, and so I just right off the bat say. That, that's not what we do. And, you know, that's to go back to your question about all grass fed, grass finished. Mm-hmm. That's how I have that conversation as well. I say that's an entirely different product sure. um, than what we offer. So uh, places that have it, places that are interested in Wagyu um, typically don't have a lot of beef on their menu. So okay. uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really come up too much. honestly. I see. I see. Okay. Now, are are you the exclusive beef provider for your customers, or are they getting are they sourcing beef from other places as well? Yeah, so um, it really varies um, when it comes to our bigger customers, our our whole half quarter customers. Um, typically, what would happen is I will deliver them beef every week. I make all of our deliveries, okay. so I will deliver them beef. Um, every week, but then they will supplement, um, especially if a restaurant has a steak on the menu. Um, we just don't have the numbers to support mm-hmm. those. So typically they'll go um, more commodity route or, or a boxed beef operation or mm-hmm. a boxed beef option, excuse me, um, for a steak. But um, or places will have us on for their burger and somebody else if they have a brisket dish or something, you know, mm-hmm. Um so for the the much smaller restaurants, we're typically the exclusive beef purveyor. Uh, for the larger ones, uh, you know, restaurants inside of hotels and whatnot, uh, we just don't have the amount. So they'll, we are a supplement to their commodity purchases. Okay. So I think that leads into the next question then. So in that case where they're doing some boxed beef, they're doing mm-hmm. some beef maybe from another provider uh, off of your farm, mm-hmm. and then they've got you – why don't if if they're going to do I guess my question is if they're going to do some boxed beef why don't they do all boxed beef why do they want to uh, buy direct from you as well For sure and I think that's a question that a lot of people um especially outside of Oregon have um Oregon is just very unique when it comes to wanting to support local farms mm-hmm. um it carries a certain cachet on menus um it's almost expected of of the higher dining ex- experiences um, that you will have a relationship with a farm, uh, whether that be vegetables or or proteins. Okay. Um, our, we're lucky that Portland's a relatively small town in terms of, you know, uh, the the nation nationwide. But um, Portland is small enough that our brand is somewhat well known uh, when it comes to consistency in a local option. So that's it's partially branding. Um, and also, I think people like to to know where their beef is coming from. Okay. Um, I think it gives a, a feeling of security, and um, you know, I believe our customer service is second to none. So that's something that the the commodity operations can't compete on. So I try to find ways, you know, that we can be competitive, mm-hmm. um, even if it's not price. Okay. So so where you're at. Uh, near Portland, Oregon, mm-hmm. those restaurants, even if they are using boxed beef, they still want to be able to say we're support, supporting local farmers and ranchers. For sure. So you'll see a menu, um, you know, that will have a good example is, um, you know, a, sta- a steak like a flat iron or a hanger that's that's so popular these days, um, mm-hmm. which is great. Um, but, you know, not a lot of pounds of that steak, of either of those steaks uh, per animal. Mm-hmm. So they'll have maybe a hanger steak, and on the menu it just says hanger steak with 
blah, blah, sides, et cetera, et cetera. But then it'll say, you know, Laney Family Farms ground beef burger. Um, so typically that's how they differentiate it on the menu. Okay. Um, and we do have a large regional brand out here called Painted Hills, um, which is lo- uh, based in, I believe, Fossil, Oregon, uh, far eastern Oregon. Um, but they're kind of the next step up. So a lot of times uh, in terms of of size of, of business. So they're much larger than us, but they're mm-hmm. smaller than IBC or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, a lot of menus will have a Painted Hills ribeye and then a Laney Family Farms burger. Okay, got it. I'm I'm smiling right now as you describe Fossil, Oregon as Far East Oregon. I live. Uh, I'm I'm 50 miles from the Oregon border where where we live, so I'm laughing because oh, nice. <laughs> I'm like Fossil is not Far East Oregon, Ontario and Jordan Valley. Now that True. is Far East Oregon, but uh, I, to you, I totally get that. Okay, so <laughs> let, let me ask your advice. If you could give our listeners just a couple pieces of advice, if they wanted to go and they wanted to try and market their beef to a restaurant in their area, what should they do or what should they not do when they're approaching restaurants and who should they talk to? Right. So, you know, it's I think it's kind of a three-pronged approach. I think it helps to, to bring samples, obviously. Um, <laughs> start with giving your beef out for free. Um, and seeing if people like it. Um, I think second of all is really knowing what makes you different. So in our case, it's the it's the grain finishing, um, and it's the fact that it's raised 45 minutes away from where our customers are. Okay. Um, really kind of think about why it's special, and if you can't think of a reason that it's special, uh, then it might not be special. <laughs> so if you, you know, if you don't know your brand, then it's, it's hard to explain to a potential customer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then third... I think you kind of have to just be available for people. Um, That's something that I've found has really set us apart. Um, My customers all have my cell phone number. They know that they can call me on the weekends. I I take calls and and texts and emails uh, with questions all the time. So uh, not that, you know, you can never have any personal time, but it helps to be available to people, especially if you're trying to bring them a new product that they're going to have questions about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, when you're bringing samples to restaurants, that's really mm-hmm. interesting. Is it okay to bring them uh, a frozen steak, or do you want it to to be fresh, never frozen? So we do sell frozen beef, um, which are when we tell our customers if it's we never sell beef that's been thawed. So we'll okay. only sell them either frozen or or fresh beef. Right. Um, but our customers really don't care about that i've found um if i'm bringing samples they're always fresh um just so you can get an experience um of what our product is typically Um, and then later on when i have a relationship if i for some reason have to sell someone a frozen piece of beef i'll discuss that with them ahead of time okay so okay so i think i'm i think i'm understanding when i sell beef to customers when they pick it up from the butcher it's all coming out of the freezer. It's been it's been processed. Right. It's been frozen. But in your case, that's not how things are going. Uh, they're delivering fresh beef to to your customers, or or you're delivering fresh beef to your customers. I should say. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. that's maybe something I should should have explained. Yes. So when you're selling, it sounds like when you sell to home customers, and it, it sounds like you have a locker beef operation. Like yeah. That mm-hmm. How you would classify it. Okay. Yep. So um, you know, that is a a cut and wrap operation Correct. will have frozen beef wrapped in butcher paper. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that's how yours is. Yep, that's correct. It comes back to you from pro- yes. So, um, uh, in our situation, we will get all of our subprimals and ground beef uh, vac sealed into plastic packaging, mm-hmm. and then that's boxed and it's all fresh. Okay. So, the only times that we have frozen products are. If we really can't sell something, we do have a small frozen inventory okay. um, that we will market to to customers. But so when we're doing our quarters, um, the animal is actually cut into eighths. So for a front quarter, it'll be a you know a large shoulder clod with the shank attached, and that's wrapped in loose plastic, not vac sealed, mm-hmm. and a rib section. And then for a hind quarter, it's a whole short line with the the um, flank attached. Um, and then the back hind leg with the shank attached as well. Okay, interesting. Now let's talk about the business structure that you have here. When mm-hmm. you are, 
when you're operating a business like you are and you're selling direct to restaurants, what do you do for liability protection? Are you an LLC? Are you some other form of a business entity? And what about insurance? Yes. So I, ha- I, am, a, I am registered as an LLC with the state of Oregon. So it's Laney Family Farms LLC, technically. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I am a single member LLC, which is another kind of part of the equation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as far as insurance, I have vehicle insurance because I have a refrigerated Ford van that I deliver out of. Okay. Um, and then I also have general business insurance, a liability and umbrella and what have you there. And then um, both of those. So I kind of double insure basically. So okay. the insurance is expensive, but not one of the larger costs of the business because mm-hmm. if I were to have an issue that issue is actually the onus of the processor. So okay. as long as I'm handling it correctly under my license, um, any sort of, you know, God forbid, quality issue or contamination issue I were to have would come back to the USDA processor and their HACCP plan. Okay. Now, you took over, uh, well, you took over this business from your parents just almost two years ago probably, right? You said 18, so... Yes. Uh, your anniversary mm-hmm. date's probably coming up here soon. So have you have you changed anything that your parents were doing or have you added any products or added any services or anything like that since you took it over? Yeah, so um I haven't added any products. We still sell the same the same products. Um in terms of doing things differently, I think that's um the whole <laughs> basically the entire dance of family succession of a business is uh-huh. is what do you keep and what do you change which is honestly you could probably do a whole separate podcast about that and fill mm-hmm. fill an episode of of that but um i am lucky in that my dad specifically but also my mom have been um entrepreneurs for many many years mm-hmm. so i learned a lot of things from them um, I will say kind of one thing that I do differently than them is that I am more interested in finding efficiencies um, on that cost side. So I like to run a, a very tight ship cost wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been maybe the main, the main difference. Um, and I, I like to get into the reporting and have, you know, have those weights be tracking all the weights, be tracking all the costs. Um, in maybe maybe a borderline obsessive way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you mentioned succession, so let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, when yeah. when this was pat when when this business came to you, how did that succession take place? Did you buy it outright? Was there a succession plan set up by an attorney uh, to pass the business mm-hmm. from one generation to the next? How did this all work? Yeah. So um, for our specific needs, um, there was no attorney involved. Um, I have a, a buyout plan, um, a yearly plan that's uh, X amount of years into the future. So I pay mm-hmm. my parents a certain amount, or the company does, um, for the brand okay. uh, per year. Um, and then eventually that will run out. Um, and, you know, it's a, structured somewhat as a, a loan type situation. You're basically buying out the company on a loan basis with, mm-hmm. with a small amount of interest on there. Um, and that, so that's basically how the structure went. Um, when I came back, I knew that I wanted to take the business over. So basically every year that I was working for them, um, was a step towards learning more about the business and, and getting into those numbers. Um, so it wasn't just a, you know, switch off the lights and turn them back on one day, you know? Okay. And then how about the, how about the land, the equipment, the facilities, all of that? Yeah. So my grandma, as I mentioned, lives on the farm. It's her property. She owns the farm. Um, And then I pay a lease to her that includes um, structures, equipment, um, and the the grazing land. Okay. So that covers that. Um, And water, excuse me, which is also another issue. Okay. Now, we've talked a lot about your consistency uh, with doing the three to five animals per week and the way you kind of mm-hmm. taper all that and make that work. Do you, is there a time of year where we see a spike in demand for beef in restaurants where they might want more from you or maybe a time of year where they might want less? For sure. Um, so the 
the traditional holiday season for us can be kind of a roll of the dice. So during the holidays, um, lots of our customers are busy with special parties, uh, buyouts, you know, people renting the entire restaurant for their company Mm -hmm. or what have you, Um, which sometimes can mean more business for us, but sometimes means that the the restaurants will be going with a a cheaper option, more of a boxed beef option um, to capitalize on those, on making a higher margin on those types of buyouts. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of a up in the air on it for us. Um, Really the time that we see a spike in beef is right when the weather starts to get nice. Um, People eat, in my opinion, uh, more burgers in the summer. So our business, at least for ground beef, especially always goes up in the summer. Okay. Now, is this your sole form of income or are you still working something on the side of this? It is my personal sole source of income, but um, I am married and my husband has a job outside of the farm. So he's a network engineer um, for a company here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, And he, so our combined income supports our household. But me, me personally, I only make money from the farm. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting question too. About 90% of farms, all farm operations in the United States need some money coming in from off the farm to support the household. Uh, does your, is your husband working off the farm by choice or is, is that by necessity? Do you need his income to support the household? Uh, because the farm is not generating enough household income. Yes. So um, he works uh, both by choice and necessity off the farm. So okay. he, when I met him, um, he was already an engineer. He went to school for engineering. He, you know, that's his career and, and passion. Mm-hmm. Um, but also uh, were he to quit, yes, we would, we would be a little tight. Um, we could make it work, but we would probably have to change, uh, change where we live and change a few other things. And also we're expecting our first child in June. So, um, that's also something that would that would really change um, if he were to not have his income. We would right. definitely be much tighter for cash for sure. Well, congratulations on that, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's it's exciting. Well, that's one of the you know, and that's interesting too. That's one of the unique challenges of being a you know being the farm boss, being the farmer, um, but being a woman and then and then becoming a mom. Uh, so who mm-hmm. will who will take over operations for? Uh, I, whatever period of time you are uh, sidelined from working because you've just given birth mm-hmm. and you're taking care of your, your son or your daughter. Yeah, you know, it's really uh, something that's interesting. There's so little data on women and any sort of maternity leave and, and all of that stuff mm-hmm. in, the, in the farm, in the world of farming. Sure. Um, so I plan to take a, a full maternity leave, so no physical work on the farm for July and August. Okay. Um, so I'll be hiring a delivery driver. One of my former customers actually will be delivering for me. Okay. Um, so he'll work one to two days a week. And then we are hiring a um, high school student to um, to do the feeding, which he did last year okay. um, during the summer as well. So it's, it'll be his summer job. And then there's also another employee on the farm um, all year, and, and he will continue to work as well. Okay. So. Got it. So yeah. you've got staff and they can help you. We do. And that. for sure. And my parents are extremely helpful. Um, they are, they still do all sorts of stuff on the farm um, to help me out. Um, so I'm sure they'll be um, unforced to pick up some of it as well, <laughs> unfortunately, but luckily they're, they're very, very helpful and eager to help. So Okay. Very good. Well, now you mentioned that both your parents have always been entrepreneurial. Was there ever anything holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Um, in terms of starting uh, something separate instead of taking this over? No, uh, mm-hmm. no. What I mean is, was there anything you had to overcome? Any fear of failure? Any, any worries oh, or see. nervousness? Anything like that you had to overcome? Oh, totally. Yes. So, um, my dad is a eternal optimist. Um, <laughs> okay. he always believes in himself and not, you know, not in a delusional way. He just genuinely <laughs> always finds a way he, right. he's a he's great at, re, at starting a business i think you have to have a certain um confidence and a certain belief in yourself mm-hmm. um so he he has always had that um i do not have that <laughs> to, to the as much of an extent as he does so i'm definitely more timid more cautious um more uh debt averse um 
just in general more worried than he is Mm -hmm. in almost every way. So um, I think that's something that has been something that's been difficult. And then, you know, getting this company and, and yes, I'm, I am paying for it to, to take it over, but basically they, they had to do the hard work and then I get to take it over. Um, Mm -hmm. That was something that was difficult as well. You know, it's, you feel like uh, there, there's no room for failure because you don't want to, um, uh, you know, ruin this right. beautiful thing that, that your parents gave you. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's something that I've profiled quite a bit on this show. I'm not a generational farmer. Uh, so my wife and, and my farm, uh, we're the first generation. Uh, but with that Ooh. said, I've interviewed a number of generational farmers uh, from West Coast to East and a lot in the Midwest. And there is that pressure on people who are generational farmers to hold on to this and not let this go. And there's this added pressure, I think, uh, to folks like yourself uh, who have this family legacy on the farm. Yeah, I think it's interesting, especially when you talk to, uh, it seems like dairy people specifically, but Mm -hmm. even larger um, beef operations. Um, Luckily, my parents are very much into the idea of me doing what makes me happy. Um, but I do think sometimes when it comes to the second generation, um, you know, I chose to come back and I, and I made this choice, but I think sometimes people, uh, have been forced to come back. Uh, luckily that's not my situation in any way, but I think that sometimes people do have that and they feel this sort of tethering to, to the Mm -hmm. operation. And I, I feel extremely fortunate to, to have a, to not have that experience at all. Yeah, and if not forced, there's there's just kind of brought up with this sense of this is what you should do, this obligation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you you know, sometimes I think people will will feel like uh I guess I I could do something different, but mm-hmm. I'd be letting my family down. Right. Um so yeah. luckily I don't have that, but that that's tough for people who do. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about business advice. I mean, obviously you've been giving us a bunch of good advice here. Can you recall uh, a single piece of business advice has been given to you that's really stood out or helped you along the way? Oh, gosh. Um, so many. I mean, I've been really lucky to learn, as I mentioned, so much from my parents, um, more than I could even quantify. Um, but I think that really the 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 best piece of advice that I was given is that if you get pride from working hard, um, whether you see, succeed or fail, um, you will know that you at least did your best. And I think that sometimes, as we mentioned, that fear of failure holds people back from really giving it their all and and sort of self-sabotaging. Um, and I think that that's maybe the, the main thing that I've learned is um, to just enjoy the gift that is working hard in general. Yeah, that's so. great. Yeah. And it is, you You say you'll know you did your best, but it's that feeling of satisfaction at the end of the day where you can look back, you can see the progress you've made, and you can know if it doesn't work, it's not because I didn't try. Exactly. And, you know, it, sometimes things just don't work, whether we mess them up or there's some sort of outsor- outside thing that's making it not feasible, but hard work is the most important thing. Yeah. For sure. Well, everybody has something they do naturally. You know, like when I became an entrepreneur, I had to do a lot of reading and studying and learning. But there's certain things I do without ever thinking about it that I didn't have to learn that helped me to succeed. I always kind of refer to that as a as a personal habit. Do you have a personal mm-hmm. habit like that, something that you never had to work on, something that just comes naturally that helps you to be successful? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I would say I would say two things. Um, I really enjoy being outside and working outside, even, you know, at one thing that's true about uh, Oregon is you will get rained on yeah. <laughs> much of the year. Um, so I think that that kind of, you know, I always played sports and I was always active in that way. And I think mm-hmm. that that really helped me um, in not, not shying away from a day of, of hard physical work for sure. Okay. Well, now for anyone listening who is looking at your business model, they'd like to emulate it or they're interested in exploring it further. Is there a book or maybe another resource, if not a book, that you could recommend that you've read along the way or you've used? Oh, um, well, I would say so. I did not go to college for business uh-huh. administration. So um, I had to play a little bit of catch up when it ter- in terms of financial reports and bookkeeping. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would recommend just starting out with 
a basic financial statements book. Um, that was something that really helped me. I, the title, I think, of the book that I got is just even financial statements. Um, just buy a textbook or buy a guidebook, um, and that's a really good place to start. Um, I'm not big on business books um, necessarily, um, just because I have been lucky to be exposed to a lot of entrepreneurs, and so I've mm-hmm. gleaned their information otherwise. But Um, I would say becoming very familiar with all of your financial reporting is maybe the best way to start. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Well, so if somebody out there listening, Hannah, if they would like to learn more, they'd like to ask you a question I didn't ask, or they'd just like to check out what you got going on, how would you like them to go about doing that? Uh, Yes, please uh, check out our website, uh, laneyfamilyfarms.com, as you mentioned, or you can follow us on Instagram at laneyfamilyfarms. Or you can email us at info at Um All of those are going straight to my phone. So if you if you reach out to us, uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. And special thanks to Hannah Laney for coming on and sharing all of that great information with us. And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.